It is crisis mode here at Kootenai Health in Coeur d'Alene tonight as they are flooded with COVID patients. Today, we heard from the Defense Department team, 20 members who arrived at the hospital to help with the exhausted staff. We have live team coverage tonight. Plus, what does that Idaho crisis mean for Washington? We'll hear from local and state leaders on where the state stands as hospitals continue to reach high capacity levels. In weather, we are tracking sunshine with hazy areas and some smoky areas as well, but continued very warm weather expected for Thursday. That and your weekend forecast is next. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here for Creme 2 News. I'm Whitney Ward. We want to begin tonight with some breaking news. We have brand new information on Gonzaga head coach Mark Few's citation for driving under the influence that happened on Monday night. Creme 2 Sports Director Brenna, G Brenna Green is joining us now with more on what we have learned so far this afternoon. Brenna. Yeah, today we've learned that Coach Few waived his arraignment. That means your attorney has explained the charges and the consequences and Few pled not guilty to driving under the influence. We've also alert fuse driver's license has been suspended for quote failure of evidentiary testing. Few was cited for driving under the influence in Coeur d'Alene Monday night. Police reports show he blew a blood alcohol of 0.119 and then 0.120. But tonight there's still a lot we don't know. While Gonzaga's new athletic director Chris Standiford has made it clear he's aware of this citation. It's not clear what consequences few might face and if he was to get suspended. We who would step into coach last night. Uh, few coach few said this in a statement quote. I believe as a leader and role model, I am expected to set only the best example. The decisions I made yesterday do not exemplify this standard. And for that, I sincerely apologize to you all. He goes on to say, I deeply regret disappointing any of the members of the community, the young men and women who comprise my campus community and the university as a whole. Of course, we'll keep tracking this story. The next time Mark Few is scheduled to speak to the media is October 9th at Craziness in the Kennel. All right, luck and change since then. Thank Thanks you. very much. All right, our other top story tonight. We do want to head now straight to North Idaho. Mark Hanrahan is now live in Kootenai County. That is where coronavirus has just overwhelmed the local hospitals there. So, Mark, we want to begin with you. And what can you tell us about what is taking place there tonight? Yeah, good evening, Whitney. First, let's set this up. Yesterday, the hospital Kootenai Health here behind me transitioned to what is called crisis standards of care. Okay, what does that mean? Well, to break it down most simply, during normal times, under normal circumstances, patients that come here, they'd expect a certain standard of care to receive that. Well, these are not normal times. As you mentioned, they are flooded with COVID patients. Resources stretched beyond thin, they say. So crisis standards of care means if you come here, you likely wait longer to be seen. If you are admitted, you may be treated in a classroom or a hallway. Uh, today, we also got to hear from the team of 20 medical personnel from the Defense Department. They were ordered or requested from the state. They're now on scene here at Kootenai Health to help out, help these exhausted doctors and nurses. They'll be here for at least five weeks, we're told, and they've been on the ground here at Kootenai Health for the past few days. Of the personnel being provided, there are 14 nurses, four doctors, and two respiratory therapists. They're at Kootenai Health to support the staff again amid this activation of crisis standards of care. We were delighted to see that, uh, that the, the standard of care was, was exceptional for the patients admitted at this hospital. Um, despite the sort of unprecedentedly large volumes of patients currently being cared for, um, the, the staff, the nurses, the physicians have been able to rise to the challenge and, uh, and, and, and fight the good fight. Um, we're also incredibly fortunate to be able to be here and provide some, some much needed offloading of that stress on this local system. In the past year and a half, Kootenai Health has not once shut down their COVID-19 unit. According to Kootenai Health's Chief of Staff, Dr. Robert Scoggins, the hospital never got to a place where they're able to discharge the last COVID patients. The hospital has maintained between three to five ICU COVID patients. Today, there are around 40 patients in the ICU. 20 of those 40 are on ventilators. That's in addition to non COVID patients who also need to be treated in the ICU. So having the members from the DOD here is relieving some stress for doctors and nurses. It's been incredible from our standpoint because of how fast they've been able to integrate into our hospital uh, and get up and running.
Okay, so the big concern moving forward from now is doctors here, they expect to see even more COVID patients following the Labor Day holiday and also the return to class for public school kids here. There's no masking requirement uh, for kids in school here, no vaccination mandate for teachers as well. And doctors here, they're concerned about that. Our Amanda Rowley joining me tonight. Uh, Cooney Health specifically held a press conference as well today where they addressed their overflow, their COVID overflow unit. It's in this building behind us, the Health Resource Center. And Amanda, that now too is starting to fill up with COVID patients. It is. So we learned today that the overflow space here at Kootenai Health has a capacity of 22 beds for COVID patients. As of today, half of those beds, 11 of the 22, are occupied. Now today, Kootenai Health is reporting that it's caring for a total of 115 COVID patients. Now at the beginning of August, just to give you some perspective, that number was 68. Now they say their biggest limitation right now is the number of staff to cover the surge in COVID patients and maintain care for non on COVID patients. Now the potential need for a field hospital depends on if the overflow beds reach max capacity. The hospital's chief regional operations officer says if it comes to that, they will rely on additional community support. When those beds fill up, hopefully they won't, right? But if they do, we will continue to work within the community with the Kootenai County operations uh, of emergency management, other local hospitals, home health, skilled nursing facilities to do our best to discharge and manage patient care as best we can. If there is a need for continued field hospital resources, that becomes a tougher challenge because again, we don't have the staff and the beds to do so. So it will be a community effort if we need to go beyond the, uh, the health resource center. That was Jeremy Evans and he says the hospital is the hospital has 550 open positions right now. 240 of those positions are clinical caregivers that they desperately need to help with the surge of COVID patients. Now, as for COVID testing, they do still have here on the Kootenai Health Campus, they still have its drive-through option available. Right. I'm told even though they are seeing a high volume of COVID tests right now, they're getting results back within 48 to even 24 hours. Yeah, my goodness. And when you talk to the doctors here, you could just tell that they're exhausted, right? They've been they at are. this for a year and a half nonstop now, and they also are pleading with the public there to get vaccinated, right? The vaccination rate in Kootenai County right around 40%. They want more people to get vaccinated. They say that is the key to staying out of the hospital getting really sick or even dying with COVID. Amanda, thank you very thank much. You. All right, let's take a look at those numbers here from the Panhandle Health District. Again, they are reporting 116 people who are hospitalized right now, as Amanda mentioned, and 315 new cases also reported today. Thankfully, no new deaths were reported today. All right, we will be back at 630 tonight to answer some of your most frequently asked questions about the situation here in North Idaho, the crisis standards of care, that team from the DOD now on site, everything. Again, that's coming up at 630. For now, though, reporting live in Coeur d'Alene tonight, I'm Mark Hanrahan, Krem 2 News. All right, Mark, thank you very much. And as we take a look at the numbers in Spokane County, hundreds of people also hospitalized with coronavirus right this minute. According to the Regional Health District, 212 people are hospitalized with COVID tonight. 353 new cases were also just reported today in the last 24 hours, as well as three additional deaths. And it's not just Spokane that is reporting high hospitalization rates. According to the State Hospital Association, at least 1,600 people are hospitalized with COVID across Washington. And as those hospitals fill up, it begs the question, could some COVID patients from Idaho ever be sent here to Washington? Kayla Lafferty has the story now from Seattle. Overfilled and understaffed hospitals have forced Idaho's panhandle to activate crisis standards of care. Under crisis standards, hospital beds, medicine, and equipment like ventilators may be given to those considered most likely to survive, not the most critical, with the goal of saving as many lives as possible. Care is not guaranteed for everyone. It is terrible. We do not want that to happen here. But in Washington, hospitals are filling up as well. So could patients from Idaho come to Washington for care even as hospitals near capacity? The short answer is yes, but our state is under no obligation to take them. We have a, um, some special processes through the Washington Medical Coordination Center and those only apply to patients that reside that are in a Washington State Hospital, that we are not um, sort of guaranteeing the help, the help to anyone that's outside of Washington State. The Washington Medical Coordination Center at Harborview oversees transfers in the state, and it's warning we're nearing a critical point. Is it a possibility on the horizon that Washington could potentially also have to activate crisis standards of care? 
we are in Washington, we are doing everything we possibly can to avoid that. But should we have to get to that point, we as a state are ready. Healthcare leaders are begging people to do what they can to prevent serious illness from COVID-19. I, I don't know the words to be able to use to plead with people to please do the things that you can to prevent this from occurring, which is getting vaccinated and wearing masks and really simple things. So that is the response from the state level. Now what about here locally in Spokane County? I had a chance to talk today with the Spokane Regional Health Officer, Dr. Frank Velasquez. He told me a couple of things. One, that local testing is still a challenge here. Increased demand means that some people are having a lot of difficulty just finding a place to even get a COVID test. He also said the problem is expected to keep getting worse as long as this spike in cases continues. But he also told me Spokane area hospitals are working extremely hard to try and stay ahead of it so we don't have to go into crisis mode here. What kind of conversations has the health district been having with the local hospitals to prepare for even more strain on the system? Because it sounds like you do fully expect that. Is there a plan for the possibility of uh, crisis standards of care here in Spokane, like we're seeing in North Idaho now? Uh, they are managing by, um, you know, flexing staff and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are not talking about crisis standards of care in uh, this region at this point in time. But I do have to tell you that that's one of the areas that we've, we've always examined. We examine all options, but right now our healthcare par partners are managing. North Idaho Kootenai Health is a very, in a very uh, specific situation. And if you think about it, one of the advantages that we have in Spokane, which is so we are a regional referral center and that gives us the ability to have uh, capacity that exceeds what you will need for a community this size. And also today, the State Department of Health released this statement saying the DOH is working with state, federal and private partners to mitigate this latest surge by accessing additional volunteer and contract resources, information sharing and even shifting patients to other facilities that can best support their care. They went on to say the goal is to prevent ever having to utilize crisis standards of care anywhere in Washington. And as we continue looking across the state in western Washington, a recent increase in COVID deaths has absolutely overwhelmed storage capacity for bodies in Cowlitz County. The coroner there had to ask county commissioners to declare an emergency so they could bring in a refrigerated trailer. Currently, a brand new morgue is under construction, but it won't be done for another month. As of right now, both the morgue and the county's funeral homes are maxed out. Altogether, those facilities can typically hold about 45 bodies, but we're being told they're currently trying to store more than 65. We're overwhelmed. My, my people are exhausted. You know, we're doing the best we can to maintain the dignity of the deceased and get them back to their loved ones so they can continue on as a family. So the new morgue there is under construction. It will be able to hold an additional 50 bodies in cold storage. Staff are set to move into that new building at the beginning of October. We know this is a lot of information and it does change often, but we're dedicated to making sure that you can get the latest information that you need about the coronavirus across the Inland Northwest. So you can always check crime.com or text the word COVID to 509-448-2000 and we'll send you a link with the latest details right to your phone. In other news that we are tracking at this hour, some more breaking news with a 10 acre fire, a wildfire burning in the Sa Lake Sashin area. So this is near Veet Road and Roberts Drive. This is video of aircraft trying to scoop water so they can help out with air support. We are told no evacuations are in place at this time. South Ponderay Fire and the Department of Natural Resources are both on scene. And as you can see, they obviously have air support and they are there on the ground as well. Boaters are being asked to avoid that area where the planes are continuing to try and pick up water. We'll continue to track this fire and bring you the very latest information as we get it. But certainly when we talk about wildfires, especially right now, dry, breezy conditions can certainly elevate the fire danger and the risk of those fires spreading quickly. So we want to turn to meteorologist Tom Sherry. When we talk about we knew it was going to be kind of breezy today, how windy are we talking about? Well, we saw wind gusts up to about 25 miles per hour. Yesterday, we thought they'd be around 30, maybe 30 
75 miles per hour. So actually we saw less wind today than we previously thought, but we knew we were going to get those winds blowing out of the southwest towards the northeast. And of course that has blown smoke into the area. So we started out good. Then we were in the moderate range just until about maybe 30 minutes ago. And now the AQI, the air quality index is just barely in the unhealthy for sensitive groups range at 102. Uh, so again, not a situation we like to see there. When you talk about the winds, you can see there wind out of the west southwest at 14 miles per hour. That's being recorded out at the airport. We're at 83 degrees and that's a live look at Cord Lane. You can see the, the smoke that is in the uh, in the air there. We'll look for temperatures in the 70s later this evening. 55 the overnight low, 85 the expected high on Thursday before a cool front begins to move in. That will drop us down into the 70s for the weekend. By the way, those temperatures you see there on your screen for the weekend. Those are our average highs. Being in the 80s right now is above average. I'll check the rest of your 10 day outlook all coming up in a few minutes. All right, Tom, thank you very much. And also coming up, a young football player's return to the field. He is in remission with cancer. He is uh, he has an amputated foot and he and I are talking about he's got to make more plays. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were there for Brandon Thomas's first game since his cancer diagnosis. This is an incredible story you're only going to see on Creme next.